proposed farm gate greenhouse gas emissions for a value added product? Oh, excellent question. Uh, at this stage, no, because it is principles and criteria and working on indicators and stops at the actual measurement. That will be something that will have to be taken into account in sustainability frameworks. Um, the AASF is largely focused on what happens on farm and there's an ongoing debate on how far up the value chain it would go and it's probably a question better put to somebody who's already doing this sort of thing in the supply chain, so whether Michael or if you'd like to maybe comment as well on how far up the supply chain your measurements go. Uh, I suppose it's more of a case of where they're going to, at least in the, the uh, short to medium term. Uh, for, for us, it's at least to the, uh, the, the cotton gin and, and maybe to, to the port. Um, would be a lot more tricky for us offshore. But in terms of the work that we're doing around data and I suppose traceability and transparency, uh, you know, we want to have a system where um, that data, wherever it comes along the, the supply chain, can be tacked on and, and, and travel with the cotton. And I, I think importantly, yes, certainly measuring is, is a core part of uh, cool soils and looking at the carbon uh, levels within the soils, but in the far also in the farming operations from a scope three perspective. Um, but importantly, it's what you do with that data and how you actually look at the practice change process that actually helps the farmer improve the reduction, whether it's carbon or in the future, the other derivatives. And, and just one important clarification, that the sustainability framework is not a reporting tool. It is guidance about where you can look for reporting tools that are specific to what's materials your farm business. So for some people that will be all the way through scope three and all the way through different um, embedded attributes in a particular product. And for others, it's less material. It, will, it all depends. Uh, hands up if you do have a question. We'll bring the microphone over to you. Katie, on sustainability frameworks, one of the questions came in. Most farmers wouldn't even know they exist. Does this matter? They wouldn't know that the frameworks exist? Mm. Uh, yeah, a lot of them don't. And it only matters in how much guidance you think you need. So the, the, uh, I sort of cut it short at the end, but that picture I had up of the, the farm with the lovely orange sunset, those are friends of mine who have some cattle, they have a few sheep, they cut a lot of hay, um, got a few chooks on the side. They're really sustainable farmers. They would never describe themselves as that if you ask them. They propagate their own trees to, to revegetate different areas of the farm. They're always looking for organics over chemical inputs just because they feel like it's the right thing to do. So they're not really looking for reporting frameworks. They don't sign up to the beef sustainability framework. They're not involved with the Behind Australian Grains initiative. But they would like a bit of guidance on how they can actually address what is most important to me from a sustainability attribute that I can focus on. So with all the 17 across um, the AASF, which do take into account things like cool soils and, and uh, cotton BMP, it's not about saying, I've got to go through all these 17 and tick every single one of them off. It's reading through them and saying, this is an area I don't really know enough about, and it might be human rights. Um, why don't I know enough about it? Do I need to learn more? Is there something I need to do here? Or am I covered? Is there legislation that's already protecting me here and I know that my business is going to be sustainably looking forward? Fantastic. Thank you. There was a question over here. Yeah, thanks, Gillian. Um, Michael, my question's to you. It's a, little bit off, it's a little bit off target, but nevertheless, I think, relevant. Um, in Australia, we have two wonderful um, natural fibre industries, being cotton and wool. Uh, your, your, your opposition is, uh, or your competition is uh, synthetic fibres. I'm just wondering why you, the two industries don't come together and work together um, to emphasise the, uh, the benefits and the sustainability of the products that you base, both produce. Because currently it seems to me that uh, you know, you're advertising and you're pitched to the consumer, you're basically competing to each other and cannibalising each other's product. I just think that there's a real opportunity to work together um, for that natural fibre industry? Yeah, I think there's probably a lot more work done behind the scenes between the two industries and uh, be aware of, and certainly some of the um, re you know, response to what's happening in Europe is being very much coordinated between the two and other, I think there's something like 17 natural fibre uh, organisations that are banding together on that. But you're dead right, our, um, our competition is uh, man-made fibres, it's not natural fibres. Um, and yeah, there's opportunity always to, to sing the plays. I mean, nobody's uh, going to um, try and uh, out, out compete cotton over wool or wool over cotton. That just doesn't make any sense at all. We'll look for more questions in the room, but while we're doing that, with growing demand for traceability from manufacturers and retailers, 
How can farmers balance transparency with protecting their data? And how are we addressing data security and sovereignty? Others might be able to talk more about data security, and I know it exists, I don't know the detail. Uh, you know, NFF has helped develop the, the um, farm data code. But I think you know, what, what we're learning and seeing from, from our industry is that, uh, and it's probably you know, in conjunction with your, your industry bodies, but just remember it is your data. Hold, hold that data and, and don't give it away unnecessarily. Um, you know, I don't know in many cases whether there's there's huge value or moderate value or just a small amount, but I'm sure there's value there. One of the, um, the brands I was speaking to in Sydney yesterday uh, was talking about a uh, Brazilian example where he was buying uh, cotton over there under a, a sustainability framework there, and he was adamant that he was actually ensuring that uh, something in the order of 15 to 20 cents a kilo extra was going straight through to growers. Now, to put that in perspective, he was talking US, so that from, from a cotton perspective, that's something like $80 a bale compared to the $2 to $6 a bale that we're getting from BCI. So at least in some uh, circumstances, data is valuable and you need to uh, continue to own it and, uh, and use it as, as you want to use it. Um. And I might add, and I think Michael, you're, you're exactly right. I think um, one, of, one of the key attributes, and we're part uh, in partnership with a number of the RDCs and CSIRO in developing the OZAG data exchange, because one of the things that we've recognised is not only is data security important, but the simplicity of managing data, particularly for producers, is critical. Most producers have multiple customers, multiple partners in the supply chain, all asking for different data. The idea of bringing a platform together to enable access to that data in a controlled, safe and secure manner to consolidate and allow the reporting to occur is a critical piece of, A, security, but also simplifying the process for producers. Being able to create an enablement for your data be, to be protected but connected is a key outcome. And, and that's, that's a real goal, particularly in, in the agricultural sector. And the only thing I really have to add on top of those, and completely agree with the other two speakers, I don't mean to undersell data security, it's absolutely vital. My bank account got hacked a couple of weeks ago, it's not fun. Data security is absolutely vitally important. But also be realistic and don't get drawn into fear mongering about people coming to take your data and steal your data any more than you would with your regular life. It is a problem for farmers, it's a problem for everybody. And I do find it frustrating when people sometimes say, oh, I don't want to give away my data to the people who are going to use it against me while they're tapping away on Facebook and having all of their data mined constantly and having drones fly over their property and map it. And there's data out there already. So be realistic about what your expectations are. Be vigilant and be aware, but also don't get drawn into the idea that somebody's going to come and, and rob you of your data either. Well, on the topic of fear, one of the questions is how can we as producers not be sceptical about these sort of bigger companies um, shoring up their scope three emissions at farmers' expense? You know, where's the value proposition for the farmer is the question. Well, you should be sceptical because they will use it against you, absolutely. Um, well, not against you, but they'll use it to their own benefit, so that can sometimes just work against you. But I think this is what comes back to when I keep harping on about the, the ASF being about shared values and about future-proofing Australian agriculture. These other things, these other benefits, the financial benefits and the potential premiums or the, the access to preferential finance, those are all really good things to have. But the reason you want to focus on sustainability efforts is because you want to do the best thing for your business, your community, your family and the land that you manage. That's why you do it. And these other things are additional attributes as well not the core reason to do it. So yet yeah, be careful and call out greenwashing when you see it is the best way to, to attack that. Two fast questions as we head into afternoon tea. How long does it normally take farmers to become accredited or complete the MyBMP program? Um, are many farmers taking up the opportunity? Almost uh, universally, the, the excuses that farmers say, oh, we, uh, we can't do it, we don't, have time. we don't have time to do it, or we don't have a chem shed in place, or we, we haven't got all our fire extinguishers, and then when they get through the program, they go, boy, that was a lot easier than what we thought. Um, the reality is, you know, out of all those practices, they are probably doing somewhere between 80 and 95% of them any, anyway, just in their day-to-day -day operations. They're just good, sensible things that people should be doing. And 
you know, it's a great checklist to just find out any places that, that you're missing. So um, yeah, the reality and the perception are two different things. In terms of people who are fully uh, accredited, it counts for about 30, 32% of our crop at the moment. Nick, why are the, this last question, why are the soil carbon measurements in the Cool Soils Initiative only measured to 10 centimetres when good soil carbon sequestration occurs beyond one metre? Um, and, and it's a current project to look at how we're actually developing and, and moving further down in the soil profile. I suppose we had to start somewhere um, and, and to build a database up and to then also have the techniques that we can roll out across a broad array of uh, soil platforms but also producer bases. So that next piece of work is being evolved and developed and, and as we know, nothing stays the same. Technologies are continuing to improve and the ability to have that, if we think about a 200 you know, grower trial, that's fairly easy to manage. Scaling that to 20,000 is a very different proposition. Thank you so much to this panel. Um, the expertise you brought this afternoon is incredible. We've all been the beneficiary of your experience and insights and your presentation. So please put your hands together for our panel. Thank you. When we come back from afternoon tea, we're here together for an hour of panel sessions with very engaging speakers who are speaking from their own experience. We have farm managers, um, we have a farmer, and we're talking about on-farm natural capital accounting. Um, that will go from 3.30 till 4.30 and then there will be networking and drinks from 4.30 till 5.30. So please go and enjoy your afternoon tea and we will see you back here at 3.30 sharp. Thank you. <laughs>